Good morning. My name is Joe Lusardi. I'm the president and CEO of Cureleaf. Cureleaf is a leading multi-state operator in the United States. We have operations in 11 states with plans to enter at least two more markets in 2019. We are a vertical cannabis company, meaning we cultivate, manufacture, and dispense cannabis. We have the largest retail network in the country with 42 stores operational today underneath the Cureleaf banner. We are also public. In October of 2018, Cureleaf went public on the Canadian Stock Exchange through a reverse takeover process. We raised $400 million from over 100 institutions around the globe, and I'm anxious to tell you our story today and how we're going to deploy that capital to create shareholder value in 2019 and beyond. First, a bit of background about myself. So I've been the CEO for the last three years. Prior to cannabis, my experience was in private equity and m and in 2010, I was responsible for opening the first vertical medical marijuana business on the East Coast in the state of Maine. I was also responsible for opening the first vertical business in Massachusetts in 2015. I joined a company called Palliatech in 2016 as its CEO, now Cureleaf, with the goal of creating the first true national cannabis brand, and I believe we're well on our way to doing that. Before I get into our company in specifics, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking about the industry in general and our perspective on how things are going, and then I'll get into the details about our business. So I think we all know this, but we've seen unprecedented growth in the cannabis sector. But having been in the industry for nine years, what's amazing to me is the accelerated pace of change we've seen over the last 12 months. It's absolutely incredible. Last year, it's estimated that cannabis was an $11 billion regulated space and growing by estimates to 23 billion in the next four years. But more importantly, the addressable cannabis market today is $50 billion and growing every single quarter. So we are incredibly optimistic about the, the headroom in the market and our ability to continue to grow given the demand for cannabis. Importantly, the public opinion is changing rapidly on cannabis, but recent polling suggests that 93% of Americans now support medical use and greater than 60% support adult use. The public perception on cannabis is changing rapidly from many different elements, primarily from a taxation perspective, and also because I think Americans are more and more recognizing that we don't want to be a society that warehouses people for nonviolent drug crimes. So we think those trends are positive, and what's happening is it's generating positive results at the ballot box in state houses, and we think at the federal level in 2019. I have never been more optimistic about the legislative framework that's happening in cannabis, both at the federal and state level. A groundbreaking event happened in December of 2018, the Farm Bill, which will have dramatic impact on our company, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. But the Farm Bill was the first break, breakthrough in the wall where cannabis is becoming mainstream. CBD, a compound from hemp, will be the first mainstream cannabis compound that will be sold nationally and will break through the, the decades of um, propaganda from the pharmaceutical industry, and we're very encouraged by that. At the federal level, we expect that despite the recent um, shutdown, once the legislator get back to work, we think the split house is going to inert to the industry's benefit in 2019. The Democrats are going to take leadership on this issue in the, in, the, in the Congress this year. You will see standalone pieces of legislation pass out of committees and on the House floor, including banking, research, and we also believe both chambers will take action on the States Act this year. We are spending a lot of time and energy in Washington, D.C., bringing these issues to light and lobbying for the interests of the industry, and we think that we'll get significant legislation in 2019. For folks that don't know what the States Act is, the States Act is a federal recognition that states can make their own marijuana policy. Why that's important for U.S. companies is because it will not only give us access to federal banking, but it will dramatically reduce our cost of capital, and it will likely allow us to list on U.S. exchanges, which is exciting to us. As I said, the, hemp was a, the, hemp, the Farm Bill was a breakthrough in, in federal legislature in 2018. By some estimates, the CBD market will be $22 billion in 2020. That is going to be the hottest trend in consumer products in 2019. You will see every company in the industry rushing into this space. Luckily, we had the foresight to anticipate this and develop a national CBD brand, which we launched in November and will be a mainstream product for our company in 2019. So medical cannabis is legal in 33 states in the U.S. Missouri and Utah most recently added to the ranks. 
In 10 states, we have adult use programs already. Hemp is now, C CBD from hemp is now legalized. All this suggests that cannabis will continue to be mainstreamed and that the companies that, that, are, that have the infrastructure today will be the ones that will be the ultimate beneficiaries of these changes and this significant growth that we expect to see in the industry over the next four years. Importantly, at the state level, what we believe we're about to see is the acceleration of adult use programs driven by the Massachusetts Catalyst. So Massachusetts is the first state on the East Coast to implement an adult use program in December of 2018. Massachusetts is a state with 7 million people and 24 million tourists. With only five stores open, the state is already projecting that the, the market's on a $100 million run rate. And we expect Massachusetts to open up dozens of companies in 2019 in the state. Massachusetts will generate tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue in 2019, and that will not be ignored by neighboring states and states all up and down the seaboard. And companies that have the infrastructure in those markets today, like Cureleaf, will be the ultimate beneficiaries of the liberalization of those programs. Maine has already passed an adult use bill. We expect Maine will implement an adult use program in the summer of 2019. In New Jersey, Governor Phil Murphy campaigned on adult use cannabis. We expect the New Jersey legislature will pass an adult use bill in the first half of 2019, unleashing a state with 9 million people to adult use cannabis. In New York, Governor Cuomo has finally gotten religion on cannabis, so much so that he put it in his budget. And by his estimates, cannabis can deliver 300 million of tax revenue to the state of New York in the first year alone. Finally, in Connecticut, Governor Lamont has acknowledged that cannabis for adult use is a foregone conclusion and that he can no longer let the black market control this industry. More importantly, this will put pressure on many other states on the eastern seaboard and across the country to look more closely at adult use programs. We fully expect that in Arizona and Florida, you will see adult use ballot initiatives in 2020. The Governor, governor Wolf of Pennsylvania has already publicly stated they need to look at adult use cannabis. And we expect many of these other states to convert to adult use programs, creating a huge amount of opportunity for um, existing operators. So how does Cureleaf play in this space? First, as I said, we are a vertical cannabis company. We have 12 cultivation facilities today with 650,000 square feet in operation today, which by many accounts makes us the largest operator in the United States. We have 10 manufacturing facilities, on any given week, we extract more than 20,000 grams of cannabis oil, and all of our products are unified under the Cure Leaf brand. So we are not hoping to be a branded company. We are a single branded company. When we built this company, we set out at the outset to develop one cohesive brand strategy around Cure Leaf. So our stores are all Cure Leaf, the vast majority of our products are Cure Leaf, and we are laser focused on creating a national brand. Our thesis on cannabis and the value chain is actually quite simple. Cannabis is a commodity. Over time, the cannabis will continue to be commoditized. We've already seen on the West Coast enormous pricing pressure on the commodity itself. We think that will be true in Canada as well. In fact, we don't believe the Northern Hemisphere will be leading the cannabis cultivation industry in half a decade. We will likely be importing cannabis from Uruguay or the Southern Hemisphere where we can't possibly compete with those inputs. But for now, it pays handsomely in the United States to be a vertical operator, given the state-by-state -state infrastructure. So for the, for the next few years, we will be a significant cannabis cultivator, but ultimately what we're focused on is becoming the most accessible cannabis company in the U.S. by having the most amount of retail where we can get to the patients and the consumers and have the shelf space, but more importantly, have a unified brand strategy where the products we sell in our stores are Cureleaf products and not somebody else's. So this is where we operate today from a regulated state cannabis perspective. We operate in Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, Florida, Oregon, Arizona, California, and Nevada. And we will enter Pennsylvania and Ohio in 2019. And I just want to point out a couple highlights from this map. So in the state of Florida, we are one of 13 vertical operators in the state. In 2018, Cureleaf opened more stores in Florida than anybody else. We just started harvesting a 250,000 square foot greenhouse in central Florida, and we will be an industry leader in Florida in 2019. 
We will open up almost twice as many stores in 2020, up to the 40 store maximum, and we will cover this state and create access to cannabis and the Cure Leaf products. In New York, we are one of 10 operators. We have opened all four of our allotted stores, and we expect to be the uh, significant beneficiary of the liberalization of that market and the conversion to adult use in the years to come. In New Jersey, we are one of six operators. New Jersey is our most mature market. In New Jersey, we have an over 40% market share, even though we're one of six operators. We have the biggest market share in New Jersey because we have the deepest amount of SKUs, we have the highest quality, and we have the lowest price in the state. In Connecticut, we are one of four grower processors. We are wholesaling now to the existing nine dispensaries, and we expect nine more dispensaries to come online in 2019, and the state to enact an adult use program in 2019 as well. And finally, our home state of Massachusetts, we are incredibly optimistic about this state given that we have one of the largest cultivation capacities in the state, and we expect to be a beneficiary of the liberalization of that market in 2019. And finally, on the West Coast, we're working our way to the West with M&A, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But more importantly, beyond just the 13 states with which we'll operate in, in 2019, we are creating the first true national cannabis brand. So we have a CBD line called Cure Relief Hemp, which was launched in November of 2018 in anticipation of the Farm Bill. We expect that Cure Relief Hemp will be sold in 47 states in 2019. We will carry the Cure Leaf brand throughout the country and create the first truly national cannabis brand in the United States on the back of that product. This is our brand architecture. So on the top left is our medical cannabis products available in 13 states in 2019. We have over 200 SKUs of medical cannabis products available today, depending upon state regulations. We make everything you can imagine from flour to vaporizer pods to topicals, edibles, oral formulations, any product that we can make that delivers cannabis to an individual that needs our medicine, we're, we can do. Importantly, we also developed, as I said, the Cure Leaf Hemp line. So this is a 15 skew and, growing, skew and growing line of products that we will carry into mainstream retailers in 2019. We are designing end caps right now for major retailers, and we expect to make announcements about this product very soon, and I'm incredibly optimistic about our ability to capitalize and be the first national cannabis brand. And finally, we do have an adult use brand that's really targeted towards cannabis enthusiasts. It's available in five states, and we'll continue to roll that product out, which is aimed at really the, the, the most enthusiastic people that want to use adult use cannabis. I believe our company is ideally positioned to capitalize on growth opportunities. We have a proven track record of success, not only in winning licenses, but also acquiring and integrating companies under one brand. There's no other company that looks like us that operates as many states under one brand as Cureleaf. We have won licenses in Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Maryland. We have acquired and integrated companies in Maryland, Connecticut, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And we have a proven track record of not only acquiring companies at highly accretive prices for our shareholders, but also integrating them into a common company with common SOPs and one common brand architecture. It takes a lot of execution to do that. Between 2017 and 2019, we will increase our cultivation and operation capacity fivefold to over a million square feet in production. We continue to grow our dispensary footprint. At the end of 2017, we had seven stores. At the end of 2018, we had 36 stores. Just this week, we have 42 stores open, and we will open up at least 68 stores with the licenses we own today in 2019. We have the proven track record of opening stores. We open a store in this company almost every week, and we will continue to do that through 2019. And stores translates into accessibility, and that translates into revenue. And finally, we'll be distributing our national CBD brand, which we believe will be on the shelves of mainstream retailers across the country in 2019. All that translates into revenue growth. Since 2016, we've grown the top line of this company almost 300% every year, and we'll do that again in 2019. On our Q3 earnings call, we guided the market to $400 million in revenue. 
I believe that CureLeaf will separate from the pack in 2019 and we will deliver industry leading returns for our investors and people will recognize that we are the highest quality asset in the industry. We have a strong financial position. As I said, we're growing this business at almost 300% on the top line every year. We expect to generate $100 million in cash flow in 2019 based on our current operations. Today, our market cap sits at $2.9 billion, which is a dramatic discount to our Canadian peers, which we don't think is justified. As I said, we raised $400 million in our equity raise, the largest single equity raise in US cannabis history. We will put $150 million of that into our existing business this year, and that leaves $250 million of dry powder plus our stock to go out and do M&A. And I believe that we are one of the best companies in the space in the M&A arena, but more importantly, do an M&A that's accretive to our shareholders. Everybody that's been a shareholder of CureLeaf along the way has made money, and that's what we believe in, is deploying capital to get the greatest possible return for our shareholders. So we'll be very disciplined in how we deploy capital, but we'll put that money to work to create value for our shareholders in 2019 and beyond. I believe we have one of the finest management teams in the industry. Our executive chairman is Boris Jordan. Boris Jordan was the primary financier of our business prior to the public offering in October. Boris has an incredible track record of success in emerging markets. He is the founder of Renaissance Capital, one of the leading emerging market investment banks in the world. Boris sits on the Council of Foreign Relations. He has an incredible capital markets experience, and he provides a tremendous amount of leadership to our company as our chairman. Our chief operating officer is Stuart Wilcox. Stuart is a distinguished operational executive. Um, and, and before Stuart joined CureLeaf, he was responsible for turning around Hostess, a well-known, iconic US brand and a well-known turnaround story. Stuart is the guy that makes the trains run on time. We have 650,000 square feet two day of operational space, and you need someone like Stuart to make all that happen. As you can imagine, government relations is a huge piece of our business given the state of play of cannabis in the US. Our head of government relations is Ed Conklin. Ed Conklin joined CureLeaf from the McDonald's Corporation where he ran government relations for the entire McDonald's Corporation for many years. Ed is not only providing leadership to our company in DC and state capitals, but also to the industry. In 2018, the industry formed the Cannabis Trade Federation. It's the business lobby that is in DC to lobby the States Act and legislation that will help US operators. And Ed is the chairman of that federation and providing a tremendous amount of leadership to the industry. Katrina Yolen is the head of marketing. Katrina has come up through some traditional CPG companies, including Kraft Foods. And uh, that handsome gentleman in the back there is Chris Malello. Uh, Chris Malello is our head of retail. Chris came up through the Home Depot and at one point ran all of Nike's North American stores. He's a seasoned retail experience and really our chief experience officer and making sure that all of our stores provide a high quality, highly consultative approach to cannabis where people can come in and learn about cannabis in a non-intimidating setting and get the products they need. I think it's important to say that Cureleaf, Cureleaf is a wellness business. We are about creating cannabis accessibility about creating education and giving people a format where they can learn about cannabis and not be intimidated. And that's where we think the market's going and we're happy to have Chris on board to help us in that initiative. Finally, this is a little bit of just macro thesis in our view of the, of the, you know, the cannabis investing landscape. I think this chart is, is actually interesting. So if you look at the estimated market size of the Canadian market right now, and then you look at the aggregate market cap of the leaders in Canada, then you look at the average, the estimated market size of the U.S. opportunity and the aggregate market cap of the U.S. operators. I think you could posit that maybe that charts backwards. We believe that there will be a sector rotation in 2019 as U.S. Com companies post significant financial re returns and distinguish themselves from their Canadian peers. I believe you will see a sector rotation. I believe that all U.S. cannabis companies almost are over, undervalued and provide significant investment opportunities for our investors. Why do I believe that? One, because the U.S. is the largest cannabis market in the world, full stop. Cannabis is the fastest growing consumer segment in the U.S. and has continued to be mainstreamed every single quarter. There are strong barriers to entry. The state-by-state -state regulations allow us to build moats on our, on our licenses and our business. 
There will be rapid consolidation led by U.S. operators. U.S. operators are the best position to roll up this fragmented market, giving their presence in the existing space. And the States Act will provide a significant value creation for our investors when that passes, if and when that passes. And finally, I think it's important to understand that in the United States, we are vertical. So we don't, not only do we control what we grow and what we make, but we control our distribution points. And therefore, we control how much we, we charge for our products, unlike Canada that has to sell their products to a government. So we believe that investors with a long-term thesis should get into U.S. cannabis because it represents a significant opportunity for value creation. So in summary, just a couple of key takeaways. We are the first multi-state operator to create a true national brand. We have the largest footprint of branded retail stores in the country. We are vertically integrated with industry-leading production facilities. We are well capitalized, and we have an experienced management team to make this all happen. Thank you all for your attention, and I have a few minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Hey, Matt. So the question is, does the Cure Leaf brand affect our ability to wholesale? So in fact, in some markets, I mean, we're primarily a retail business. We are very focused on being vertical and making sure that our products go through our stores because that's where you enjoy the highest margin. But in fact, in some markets, we do wholesale. So for example, Cure Leaf is, is uh, available for wholesale in the state of Maryland, and you can buy it in more than half the dispensaries in the state. So we do wholesale it on a limited basis, but we're really focused on creating the biggest retail footprint and, and Providing the products into our stores. Thank you for that question. I'm glad you asked that. So, Cure Relief owns 98% of its assets today. We have almost no minority partners at this point. That is all behind us. The, everything you see here is what we own. So, I'm glad you asked that. This is not a portfolio. This isn't a collection of assets with minority partners. This is one integrated company that's owned 98% by Curaleaf. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So we announced in the fall that we, we, we um, have the ability to do a $50 million share buyback. It's no secret that the market said we're incredibly volatile in Q4. I think it was, the, you know, by some accounts, the worst equity markets in a decade. So basically, we made that announcement to show shareholders that we stand, we're standing in and we believe in the value of our business. We're going to deploy capital where we get the best possible return. And that means if the market falls off and our share price is low enough, we'll buy back our own shares. Because we're well capitalized, we can generate $100 million of free cash flow this year on our own business. And so we can deploy that capital to wherever we get the best return for our dollar, including buying back shares if we have to. Well, that's an interesting question. So you're not really allowed to be organic given the federal uh, standards. You can't say you're certified organic, but yes, in many instances, I mean, we grow cannabis as the, some of the strictest standards in the country, including Massachusetts and Nevada and soon to be California. So we grow everything without pesticides. If we use pesticides, we use 25B pesticides, which are organic. And all of our products are ex exit tested, meaning that they have to meet the standards of that state, including their mold-free, microbial-free, no heavy metals. And so we believe we're providing some of the safest products in the industry. And frankly, that's why we're so optimistic about the mainstreaming of Canada, because I think consumers are more and more recognizing that there are, particularly in the black market, there are unscrupulous growers, and you don't know what you're getting in that product. And so we're proud to say that our products are exit-tested, highly reliable, and safe for our consumers. It's time for one more question. All right, thank you all for your time.